So you guys probably work with more development teams than anyone else in this ecosystem. So you kind of know what everyone else is working on at any given time. One of the biggest uh, releases recently and announcements has been uh, Bancor's Liquid Dapps uh, platform that they released some information on recently. Uh, what could you guys tell us about that? Do you have any involvement with it at all? And do you think it is going uh, to help us solve a lot of these scalability issues we've been seeing? So a lot of people don't know this, but the guy behind that project, his name is Tal Muscal. And he actually wrote the Bancor algorithms for EOSIO. If you go into the code for the marketplace inside of EOS that converts RAM and CPU and all of that, uh, that's his code, right? This guy is intensely smart. And a couple of months ago, he came and shared an idea with me, which was this liquid dApps kind of uh, VRAM, uh, what did they call it? It was uh, uh, DSPs. I remember because DAP I'm service a, providers, yeah. Yeah, so DAP they're, they're, service providers. They're like block producers, but on this just VRAM system. So they all produ right. provide VRAM for any chain, not just EOS, but it's pretty much been catered towards so you EOS. You can think currently. of them kind of like BPs, but all they handle is RAM for DAPs. Yeah. Right. And it's, it's completely separated from the mainnet. And um, what it does is it helps contract developers put the data that they need to store into contracts off the chain into something else so they don't have to pay these astronomical prices for RAM because RAM is actually quite expensive. Even if it's low right now, you take those pennies and you put them together and you end up with a million dollars worth of RAM, right? Um, and the way that they, I've seen this in action, it's brilliant. And the way that they put it together makes a lot of sense. You know, it, it, if we're talking about companies building applications, you don't have all of your applications on one server. You would never see a game company with every single one of their games on one server because if that server falls, all of their games fall, right? Uh, and they're kind of solving that problem by pushing this horizontally instead of vertically like we currently have on the EOS mainnet, at least for now until sidechains come and you know, all of that kind of stuff. But we have to wait a bit for that. So there's solutions in the meantime. That's That's... Awesome. So VRAM is just the first thing that they've announced that they'll have ready sooner rather than later. Mm -hmm. But it also sounds like they've got vCPU. So that that's exciting. So what we've seen recently is a lot of applications, they're, they're getting congested on the main net, so they're being forced off of the main net. But mm -hmm. by, by lowering the congestion and resource costs on the main net, it's going to be a lot more appealing to just stick to the main net because you could buy all this vCPU, VRAM, and v, vNet. There's a philosophical question here, isn't there? If these options are available, uh, was it only put into the main net to make our lives easier? And now that we've all understood those possibilities, is it okay for us to extrapolate ourselves into these other uh, possibilities? Or could this have been done from the get-go? Is this a philosophical question? All right. Is that rhetorical? Uh, no, I'm, I'm asking, do you, do you think it would have been better off for us as the mainnet provider, maybe not us, but for the mainnet providers to have done this from the start and kind of put those onto separate chains and all maintain them at once? Because if we're looking at the DSPs, they're probably going to be the BPs. That, that's what it, uh, who Bancor is catering to right now. They want to give right. BPs the first crack at this because this is a great revenue stream for anyone already running a data stream or running a full node anyway. So mm -hmm. really all you're doing is you're running more instances, uh, increasing mm -hmm. your bandwidth, and then you just basically flip the switch on it. I'm a DSP now on this infrastructure and on the other infrastructure, I'm running my, my, my block producer, but it's all- We need shirts for that. I'm a <laughs> DSP now. <laughs> So I, I think that's great because it's such an e <laughs> the the expertise, the technical capability, everything's already there on a block producer team. They don't have to hire anyone new. They don't really they just have to increase the the infrastructure that they already have. And then they're, they're on the other side of that. I think it's fantastic that people like, well, maybe not us, but people who don't have as much resources as us can just come in. They can take their machine and tack themselves onto that network and make some 
make some money by becoming one of these DSPs. You don't need to have an astronomical amount of RAM. The available RAM that you have is enough because you, you adding the pennies together are adding to that stack. Your one gigabyte of RAM available is okay. That, that's interesting. I'm, I'm curious to see how their pricing model is going to work. So if I'm a DSP, I'm allowed to put together my own pricing package and, and kind of mm -hmm. sell myself with all my unique attributes. So being an active block producer might actually give you faster uh, latency on, on the main net, right. for example. So that would be a, a, a main net producing BP might actually be able to charge slightly more because they have lower latency, for example. So it, it's going to be really interesting to see all of the varying price points, and, or if everyone just tries lowballing each other to just try to uh, acquire customers. You know that's what's going to happen. We'll, we'll see. I, I think BP's bringing their reputation that they've already built up is going to give them a huge advantage in the system and the low latency times for the, the ones producing also. Have you ever seen those websites where uh, people can kind of crowdfund together and buy things at, um, what's that called? Not at retail prices, at... Distribution auction prices price? at auction prices yeah um, like uh, i've seen that with like vacations like if i had 20 friends right. wanted to go on the same vacation right. they'll get a huge discount exactly i wonder if that'll actually happen with that stuff if people kind of put their ram together around their own uh you know where they are in the world and try to give competitive packages sounds a lot like a mining farm to me on the <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like you sound like you're just describing a mining farm. Are we uh, moving yeah. back to proof of work here? Yeah. <laughs> so just right? as I thought we were going to be decentralizing things a little bit more, now we've got already got plans to recentralize after this. You season. can choose if to go with them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I actually have a question for you guys. I was talking with somebody recently. They were asking me about who do you get to audit your EOS smart contracts, and. Uh, the answer was, well, most people who have those kind of skills are working on projects. <laughs> you know? And so, and the conversation ended with me now, now auditing smart contracts. So, and, and I didn't, you know, I didn't, I didn't plan for that. It's just, it's just true. It's hard to, to find someone with yes. the requisite skills that isn't really occupied right now. Um, but since uh, we're working together on an adapt here, and uh, we're looking for somebody <laughs> out there. You, you guys talk to everyone. To no, we're not contract. asking you. You're too busy, right? Um, and if this conversation ends that way, then fine. Um, but uh, do you guys know of anyone out there who uh, is moonlighting as a, a smart contract auditor? Yes, there's uh, there are a lot of people person. pretending. Um, but hey, he, don't know he, about he, was about to, he was about to answer that, Pete. Yeah, go yeah. for it. <laughs> if there's one person that I think knows a lot about all the vulnerabilities inside of the EOS IO smart contracts, it's Saeed Jaffrey. He's like written documentations about the uh, vulnerabilities and all kind of stuff like that. Uh, apart from that, there's also, um, damn, what's his name? I'm sorry, I can't say this on camera, but I'll have to send it to you later when I can remember his name. So. Truthfully, I've gotten that question a couple times, and each time I refuse, just because even I don't feel like I'm proficient enough to audit smart contracts. It's a shitty job industry to be in because you get one hack from a vulnerability that didn't exist when you audited it, and you're the right, bad yeah. guy now. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's like I don't, you're being I don't, set up I don't, to fail. I don't know. I don't, think, I don't think that's fair. I think that like people are... It, uh, should, it isn't fair. It isn't fair, but it still happens. Okay, but no, listen, like, wh my, it doesn't affect Microsoft. I mean, they get hacked, like, all the time. <laughs> oh, all come on. We were, we were ripping on Skype all morning. <laughs> <laughs> so bad. It's so bad. Uh, uh, okay. We had this Telos thing recently. Literally before this chat, uh, I w what I'd said before about you haven't been in the scatter chat for the past 30 minutes, there was a guy ripping on scatter for like 30 minutes before this chat uh because of this whole telos thing where they were blaming us for being negligent oh my God. uh for for that stuff and look he has he has some points i you know I get we, where he's coming from yeah i get where he's coming from we're supposed to be the gatekeeper but we can't possibly know all of the attack vectors and I've talked to quite a few people who, you know, we're at a 1 million EOS has been stolen due to that scan. And 
that's a lot of money. And I've talked to some of these people and they're devastated. Like the amount of devastated that I am because it's happening it doesn't even compare to how devastated they are. And there's literally nothing that I can do. I can't change history. We've updated Scatter to provide some warnings, but people aren't updating fast enough. And if they're getting scammed, then God, it sucks, man. It hurts. I, and I, think, I don't want I think, to have that extra bit. Ooh. I think that like people forget, like software development is like a very technical, um, digital thing, but software lives an organic life. Like, the things that happen during the lifetime of software is something that's influenced by uh, the culture that it resides in, is influ influenced by the people that are using it. And we find out about these vulnerabilities uh, in an organic fashion. They happen. Um, they, there are like malevolent spirits that are out there in the world that they, they, they do harm. Uh, <laughs> my, my point is that like there, there are malevolent actors uh, that will do harm, and it's it's our job at Scatter to to reduce the amount of harm as much as we can. We can't reduce it to zero. Um, we hope that as time progresses, we'll get better, and we'll know more, and we'll be able to stop more. Uh, unfortunately, that's just the way that all software development happens, and especially in a completely new industry where the things that are happening just nobody's ever experienced like no, nobody's ever had like an update off hack before what what is this <laughs> let me tell you i lost okay so scatter lost about sixty thousand dollars maybe four months ago due to a smart contract bug this isn't a smart contract bug that could have happened on any other blockchain it had to do with the fact that we set in a, uh, a limit on the amount that our contract could take of eos and then i unstaked more than that amount, and then it refunded all of that money back to EOSIO.stake. Mm. This is the first time that any bug like this had ever been found or could have ever been found because nobody even thought to you know, nullify the possibility for EOSIO stake to have different you know, conditions. Uh, we just simply don't know all the things that we don't know. And as, you know, if EOSIO changes tomorrow, we're going to have new things that we don't know. And it's changing constantly. And there's just, you know, we have to let somebody burn first so that we can help save all of the others. As sad as that sounds. Yeah. So how do we keep, uh, how do we fight back against the, you know, the reaction that people have to this? You know, something, there's some hack on like bet dice or whatever. So mm. Some company suffers a hack and it's an, it's something, you know, the bet dice instance was uh, the hack was enabled by some vulnerability that no one was talking about before it happened. You know, and now it's public knowledge. Right. Uh, but everyone, <coughs> how do we how do we kind of push back? This is a little bit more philosophical and help people understand that that was not, you know, some negligent action on the part of bet dice. It was an unfortunate coincidence that this vulnerability was just got to be a human in their contract. You have to be a yeah. human, man. Like this guy that came into the chat at first I was, he, he came in like whipping guns and calling us scammers and like, you know, all of that. And it hurts. It, it really does. It hurts to be called a scammer when you're trying to build things to protect people. But uh, at the end I took a step back, you know, I thought how, what this would do if it was my children uh, being affected this way and how they would react. And it was exactly how this guy was reacting. He was scared. Uh, he was hurt. He didn't know what to do. He didn't trust us or EOS or blockchain anymore. And you just have to step back and you know treat him as the human that he is and say, hey, you know these things happen. Uh, we're all in this together. We all are trying to hold hands like hippies and help each other through these hard times and find ways to protect each other because without that, there's nothing that we can do. This is why we're open source so that anybody can help us make everything stronger. Not just our tools, but all of the wallets that integrate with us as well and all the users that use them. Because without that, we're all just swimming in really, really deep water. Right. This is the part this is the part where we all sing Kumbaya. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>